Hello. Good morning, everyone. Um, there are some more seats over here if you're just coming in. Um, a good number of seats at the front here. Now a couple have got seats with your name on right there. Great. If you are um, doing a notice, it would be useful if you could just come to the front. Uh, if you um, know you are doing a notice, that will be Ben just to begin with, um, and then James and Carol. So if you guys could just get yourselves ready to do a notice. But welcome to Broadme Baptist Church. Um, it's great to see you here this morning. Um, if this is your first time particularly, then you're really welcome. We hope you feel welcome here. Uh, my name's Jay. I'll, lead, I'll be leading us through the, the first part of today's service. Um, and Mark will be preaching to us later on from the book of Revelation. Um, so we're about to start a four weeks, a kind of series in Revelation, an, an absolutely epic book of the Bible which has many mysteries that Mark is going to clearly unravel to us um, later on. Uh, let's have a few notices, though, starting off with Ben. Thanks, Ben. Uh, the mic's over here. Sorry. Hello. Is it on? No? Morning, everyone. Um, if you haven't met me before, my name is Ben. I'm helping to lead the student group here at Broadmead for the following year. Um, and if you're a student here today, um, and perhaps it's your first time visiting Broadmead, then we're really glad you're here. Um, at Broadmead, we love having students as part of our, of our church family, and we really want to help you make the most of your time in Bristol. And one of the ways we do that is through our student group, which meets on Sundays after church. And as a group, we, we really have three aims for our students. Um, we really want to help students grow as, as followers of Jesus, becoming more like him in their daily lives. We want to help students grow in their love for the local church and get stuck into serving God's people. And lastly, we want to help to equip students to boldly share that message of Jesus, of his death, his resurrection, to those around them. So just to give it a really brief picture of what the student group looks like on a typical Sunday. So we'll, we'll gather together at around 1.15. We'll have some lunch together, which is free. We'll provide that, of course. And then we'll open up God's words, we'll um, have a Bible study, we'll study the Bible together before praying for each other um, in smaller groups. Typically, we would work our way through a particular theme or a book of the Bible. Um, and this year we're starting uh, quite a short series just focusing on the gospel. So what is the gospel and, and how does it apply to our lives today? What does it mean? And beyond Sundays, uh, we also really want to give the, every student the chance to read the Bible with an older Christian in, in more of a one-to-one -one setting. Uh, and we believe that's just a really great way to delve deeper into God's Word and form really stronger friendships with, with other Christians across the wider church. So if any of that sounds interesting to you, our student group will begin meeting again from next week. So do feel free to, to join us after church next Sunday. And we also have a bunch of flies just by the table that you probably passed as you walked in, um, just with our, our term dates, uh, the dates we're meeting for the term. So hope to see you there. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is James, and I just want to make a quick announcement um, to make you aware of the Broadmead Mercy Ministries prayer group. Um, now, let me explain what that is. Um, so God calls us as Christians to show mercy to those in need, um, and we're all in need, whether it's spiritual, physical needs, or other. Um, but if there is an issue that really um, emotes compassion within you, um, we want to bring that to this group and take it to God in prayer. Um, and present our request before him um, for mercy ministries within this city. Um, so if that touches your heart, um, or if you're interested in that, um, come and find me after the service. I'm wearing a bright yellow jumper, hard to miss, um, and you can find out more about that. We, we, we meet usually once a month um, for dinner and prayer, um, and it looks like our next meeting will be on the 19th of September, which I think is a Thursday evening. Um, but as I say, if you'd like to find out more, um, just come and find me after the service, and I'll be happy to um, give you information or just uh, tell you what you want to know. Thank you very much. Hello, mine is a very quick thank you. We put a notice in the newsletter a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago, um, to say that we had Ukrainian friends who had been finally given a flat and that they needed furniture. 
So this is a thank you from Yulia, who wants me to say thank you to all of those who were so generous. She was really overwhelmed with how many people came forward offering beds and chairs and bits and pieces for the kitchen. And she's been able to manage uh, to furnish her flat with the, with the help of, of Broadmead. And so it's just an encouragement. She was really touched. It's a really wonderful way to show a practical love for people who are in need. And I want to say a big thank you from her. Good morning, everyone. My name is Carol. We will uh, hold a Chinese painting workshop on September 29th uh, from 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. This is the second event of church family integration. Whether you have uh, tried it or not, uh, we invite the church family members to attend this workshop. If you would like to join, please feel free to uh, use the sign-up link or the QR code for the enrollment. Since places are limited, please sign up as early as possible. Thank you. Here are some, yeah, the, if you would like to join, just sign up. Thank you. Great. There's a, there's a couple more notices, but we'll have them later because I don't think our, our brains can handle so, uh, so many notices. So we'll, we'll have a, a couple more things. Um, but isn't it great that so much is going on in our church family? Let's just um, turn our minds just to a few verses from Revelation 1, which we'll be reading actually later on. We'll read the whole chapter. Um, and I will be kind of referring to a few verses in this, um, in this chapter as well in the first half of our service. And Let's just listen to these words that describes um, Jesus. Uh, John is on, on an island having a vision of heaven. Um, and let's just, let's just try and listen to these words. It says, Among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, and with a golden sash round his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze, glowing in a furnace and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. Aren't these just amazing words as we, as we think of our God, who is holy and incredible and amazing? Um, John fell down. That was his reaction. He fell down as though dead. That's all he could manage. What a holy God we worship. This isn't just, this isn't just someone, a, a kind of mate down the street, or even a king, or a prime minister. This is the king of the universe. This is the Lord of lords. This is the God of gods. And we're here together to worship him. Um, but let's just first bow our heads in prayer, and then we'll stand and we'll sing together. Father, we thank you so much for this new day that you have made. And Lord, you know our hearts. You know what we're feeling this morning. You know the things that we're coming to church with this morning. You know our every situation. Lord, you know the difficulties that we're facing. You know the things that we're thinking about, the things that are on our minds. Lord, you know the things that have gone well this week for us and the things that have been a struggle. But Father, we do pray this morning that each of us would have just a glimpse of your holiness and your greatness and your magnificence, your otherness. Father, we just pray that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to stand and we're going to sing a couple of songs. The first one is called Only a Holy God. And these verses just point us towards that, don't they? A holy God, a, someone who is just beautiful and great. So let's stand and, and sing together. Sing who else? Who else commands all the hosts of heaven? Who else could make every king bow down? Who else can whisper and darkness trembles? And only a holy God. What are the 
beauty demands such praises. What of his splendor as shines the sun? What of the majesty rules with justice? Holy, a holy God. Come and behold him, the one and the only. Cry and sing holy, forever a holy God. Come and worship the holy God. What a glory consumes like fire. And what of the power can raise the dead? And what of the name remains undefeated? And only a holy God. Come and behold him, the one and the only. Cry and sing. Who else could rescue me from my failing? Who else would offer his only son? Who else invites me to call him father? And only a holy God, only my holy When the enemy surrounds and my heart grows faint within, when the darkness overwhelms and my fears are pressing in, I will trust in you, O oh Lord, in the silence of salvation, my steadfast hope, that it won't be shaken, my soul will wait, my soul will wait for you. You're my stronghold and my shield, in the midst of every threat. My 
salvation, my steadfast hope that won't be shaken. My soul will wait, my soul will wait for you. You're my comfort when I feel forsaken, my refuge and my sure foundation, my soul. to trust in you. Help us by looking at your holiness and your great love for us. May that just give us such encouragement here this morning. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please take a seat. Well, if there's any, um, if there's any children here, then you're really welcome to come to the front. Are there any? Ch- oh, there are. We have got some children. Right, I need the other mic. This one? Hello. Right. Okay, that didn't go well. Right, you guys, you're not allowed to touch this. If it comes down, the whole thing's ruined. Can you go and stand just down there, children? Just on the floor there. Yeah, all of you. Yeah. Sam, it's not the limbo. Okay. Right, that's it. Just put yourself down there. Right, children, you can, you can, if you want, sit. Why don't you sit down and then and face the front? So you need to sit on the floor. That's not the floor. You're close. That's it. On the floor. Turn around. Turn around so you can see the front. Turn around. Turn around. Turn around. Right. Okay. That took a lot longer than I thought. Um, I've got five clothes pegs. Who would like one? Anyone? Right, I'm just going to give them out at random. There we go, one here, one here, one here, one here, one more, okay. Right, hold on to those, because we'll need those a little bit later, okay? Here's the big idea, children. I want us to think about, and you know what? We're going to be thinking about this today, everyone. So if you're sitting over in the, in the congregation, um, this is very applicable to us as we look at Revelation chapter 1. The great news is, children, you are also going to be looking at this kind of thing in your children's groups later on, um, Revelation chapter 1, and, and looking at quite what it all means, uh, which is quite exciting. And I want us to think about that God is forever, okay? God is forever. That's the, that's the big idea. Um, there should be a verse on the screen, um, and this verse is from Revelation chapter 1, and it's verses 17 to 18. And it says, I'm going to read it out. It says, when I saw him, this is talking about Jesus, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead and now look, I am alive forever and ever. 
and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Isn't that amazing? So what I want us to think about is that God is forever. He always was, he always is, and he always will be. He never changes. Now, for the keen-eyed among us, you might have noticed this piece of wool. Have you seen it? And um, what I want us to imagine is that this piece of wool is like God, in as much as it has no start and no end. It's got no start and no end. What I want you to picture is that this piece of wool that has no start and no end is kind of now on its journey through Africa. It crosses the, kind of goes to Morocco, crosses that bit of water, (laughs) whatever that's called. It's now in Spain. It's going across to France. This piece of wool is long, isn't it? It's now crossing the English Channel. It's uh, crossing the Calais Dover. It's going up the, um, anyone? M20? No, making it up. Then it goes on the M25. Then it goes on the M4. And then it goes on the M32. And then, amazingly, it comes into Broadmead Baptist Church. And it kind of comes through a back door that no one knows about. It comes secretly through there. Now we can see it as it journeys on. It goes through there. It goes out the door. It heads north up to Scotland. And then who knows what is beyond Scotland. Just keeps going and going. Now, this endless piece of wool is like God, in as much as it has no start, it has no finish, it never changes, and actually, if you look at any piece of this wool, if you were to look at the bit over there or the bit over there, it's exactly the same. Do you agree? It's no different at all wherever you were to look on this piece of wool. And you know, God is always perfect. God never has grumpy days. He never takes holidays. He never forgets about you. He always does what he says he will do. Always. And actually, sometimes your parents get it wrong. He is nodding. Definitely, we get it wrong. We don't keep our words or we break our promises or we get held up in traffic. But God, that never happens to God. Did you realize that? That never happens to God. He always says, what he always does what he says he will do. So we can trust him. Now, what I need, this is the point where if you have a clothes peg, can you come up to the stage here? And what I want you to do is to imagine that your life is that clothes peg. Okay, that is your life. All right. Why not have some extras as well? Now, if that is your life, who do you need to hold on to? (laughs) So uh, we'd love to hold on to you, but who could we hold on to in our lives? Yeah, exactly. Say that again. God. What did you say, Amy? Jesus. Yeah, great. So if we hold on to Jesus, we hold on to God, we know we will be safe. So why don't, one by one, do you want to start, Grace? Put your peg on the on the piece of wool. Oh, dear, I didn't think that would happen. Okay. Amy, do you want to put yours on? Joe, I'm going to get a clothes pair for you as well. Right, who's next? Put one on. Okay. You want to put that one on? Okay, take it off. Do you want to put that back on? Can you do it? There we go. Well done. Let go. Let go. Yeah, good. Go on, then, Ruben. Can you put yours on? And I want you to be imagining that this is your life and that you are holding on to Jesus, aren't you? Well done. Has anyone else got a clothes peg that we haven't had yet? Sam, do you want to put yours on? Jonah, do you want to put yours on? As it gets caught on some hair. Right, excellent. Right, well done. You guys, can you go and sit down? Okay, so what you can see is just about that if these are the children's lives, they are on, they are on, they are holding on to Jesus, aren't they? And what's amazing is that actually, if this is someone's life, if we just take it forward a little bit, that, imagine that is someone's life. That's not a lot in eternity. If we look back and we look forward, it's a very small part, isn't it, that we are. But God says, trust in me, trust in me, and you will be with me for eternity. Isn't that an amazing promise to hold on to, that we are safe because we are holding on to Jesus and that we can trust in him because he doesn't change. So 
let's pray. Let's pray. Um, and then we're going to sing a song. So let's pray together. Dear Father, thank you that you are forever. Thank you that you do not change. Thank you that we can trust you every day, always. Please help us to remember that we will always be safe when we're holding on to Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Now, brilliantly, the children are already up at the front. And children, we're going to be singing a Good News Family. Because this is good news that we want to share with people. Does anyone remember the actions for Good News Family? Okay. Can you stand up? Face, face everybody. Now, the chorus, and we need everyone doing this. You might remember this. We haven't done this song for a couple of months, though. So we've got good news for you. We're going to point out. So good news, thumbs up for the good news. Good news for you. And then good news, thumbs up for me. And then good news, it's Jesus. And then we're the good news family. We'll just kind of do some generic thumb movements. Okay. So there we go. Kids, you can stay at the front and you can help the adults because they're not very good at actions. Um, so you can definitely help them out. All right. So let's stand. We got good news for you. We got good news for me. We got good news. It's Jesus. We're the good news family. And again, we got good news for you. We got good news for me. We got good news. It's Jesus. We're the good news family. Jesus came down from heaven. God in the flesh. Perfectly. said he had come to seek and save the lost and he paid for our sin dying on the cross got good news we got good news for you we got good news for me we got good news it's jesus we're the good news family we got good news for you we got good news for me we got good news, it's Jesus, we're the good news family. Jesus rose up from the dead on the third day. Met with his witnesses and sent them on their way. The promised his Holy Spirit to empower them. We got good news for you. We got good news for me. We got good news. It's Jesus. We're the good news family. We got good news for you. We got good news for me. We got good news. It's Jesus. We're the good news family. We're the good news family. We're the good news family. All right, well done, kids. That was good work. Right, kids, go and have a seat. You're not going out quite yet. You're going out in a few minutes. So panic not. Um, right, praise God for that. Hey, praise God. Uh, isn't it great just singing together and, and, and finding out more about him? Um, we are going to just have a couple more uh, things about what's going on in our church family at the moment. Um, so, Sarah, do you want to um, come and give your, yeah, you, uh, use the mic, yeah. And then I think Annabelle as well should be on. Um, hello? Yeah, great. Welcome. Um, right, so a couple of quick notices for the women in the church. First of all, it's not too late to join the Galatians daytime or evening studies. Same study, Wednesday morning and a Wednesday evening. Um, the Wednesday mornings start this week and the Wednesday evenings start next week. Claire, are you anywhere? Where's Claire? Claire, right, Claire's standing up looking gorgeous in a yellow scarf, so look out for Claire, because you need to go and speak to the yellow scarf lady if you want to have a bit more information. 
and she needs to order a journal for you. Um, yeah, I would just say about the study, don't be thinking, oh, it's intense, or don't be put off. It's a really relaxed uh, environment. It's really good for discussion. I would say it's a place where you'll find a lot of encouragement and a lot of hope. And if you don't like discussions, you can just come along and be quiet and listen in. But I'd really encourage you to give it a go. It's a bit different. And the second announcement is for Saturday, the 28th of September, we have a women's newcomers brunch. So if you're new, or if you just feel like you're new, then you're really welcome to come along. Um, take a flyer. There should be some near the entrance or somewhere on the table. If you, you, you might find that coming into church, it can feel a bit overwhelming, can't it? When there's lots and lots of people around and you don't know who to talk to um, or you can't find that one person that you met three weeks ago. So if you would like to come along and just make some new friends, get to know people and chat, this is a really good opportunity. Um, that's, oh yeah, 28th and there's delicious food. I can vouch for that. Hello, I've got a few notices about hospitality that's happening in Broadmead in the next month or so. Um, so the first one is actually church lunch. <laughs> well, we talk about hospitality month first instead. Okay, so hospitality month will be happening in October. Um, so this is a month where we invite people from the church to put on events, which other people from the church can sign up to attend. Um, so this is a QR code to sign up to host an event. So event can be uh, yeah, anything, anything you want, really. It's, it's Keep it quite simple. Uh, the things like uh, having people over for meals, going out for walks, um, yeah, going out to, uh, for coffee with, with a couple of people. Yeah, there's a couple of other examples up there. Um, so you sign up to host. You can start to host this week or next week. And then from next week, there will be some events up around the church which you can sign up to attend. Uh, so that's Hospitality Month. And the other one is Church Lunch which will be on the 22nd of October, no, 22nd of September, two weeks' time. Uh, we've got a, a fantastic lineup of cooks. There'll be a, a very nice meal after the service. It's free, open to all. You're all welcome to attend. Um, but if you are able to help with clear up or um, set up or bring a cake, then please come and speak to me or Corrine after the service. Uh, Corrine, do you want to wave again? There's Corrine. Me or Corrine after the service, if you can help with set up, clear up, or cakes for church lunch in two weeks' time. Thank you. Great, thanks very much. And there's one um, one notice as well uh, regarding Mark. Um, Mark's having an operation on Friday. It's just Friday, isn't it, Mark? Um, and that is for the removal of a, a benign tumour. Um, and they need to do quite quite a kind of big operation, really, in terms of. Um, an incision to, to remove it, uh, meaning Mark's going to be out of action for probably the best part of a month from Friday. Um, he has stressed that, that you are welcome to, to message him and WhatsApp him kind of after the operation. He doesn't have to, he's not kind of, you know, lying low and not wanting to, to speak to anyone. So do feel free to, um, to kind of contact Mark, but just be aware of that. Um, and let's just pray now um, together for that. And as the kids go out in a minute. Father, we thank you for, uh, for this morning again. We thank you for all the many things that are happening in our church, Father. We want to be a church family. We've just been singing. We are, we're a good news family. Lord, there is good news. We've been reading it in Revelation about thinking of eternity, that you are forever, that you are holy, you are unchanging. And also that we are a family. Lord, we're broken. We are far from perfect. Um, and we need your help, Lord, day after day. Um, but we thank you, Lord, that what unites us here is Jesus uh, and a love for him. And Father, we particularly commit Mark to you. We just pray for his operation on Friday. Lord, we just pray that you give him peace. And um, we pray that you'd give the, the surgeons and the doctors and the nurses wisdom um, and kindness. Uh, we pray that it would be a, a, a good operation, a successful one. Um, and Father, that you would just bless the recovery process, help that to, to be really speedy. Um, and Lord, we do just pray for the children. Thank you so much for them. We just pray as they go to their groups that you bless them, give them a wonderful time. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, children and young people, we have the sparklers and creche. You're going out the, the fire exit door, not the music cupboard door. Uh, you'll, you'll you quickly come out of there if you go there. So the fire exit door um, and through there, the, uh, the sparklers and creche. Um, and then we've got the connect and uh, what's the other group? I've lost, what, I've lost my train of thought, sparklers. 
Explorers, there we go. I thought I'd said sparklers. Explorers um, and Connect, you're going out that group. Why don't you just turn to the person next to you, say a hello as the kids are going out, uh, and then we'll carry on our service. Thanks for, uh, thanks for your playing. Okay, if you'd like to um, draw your conversations to a close. Sorry to have to interrupt. Um, Sally Ann, I think, is going to come now and lead us in a time of prayer. Um, please do continue those conversations, though, afterwards. But let's come now to a time of prayer. Good morning, everyone. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for our wonderful church and that we can come together to worship you in community. Thank you that you sent your son to die and rise again so that we might be set free. Thank you that you call us children and that we may call you father. Thank you for this love which you have lavished on us. Let us grow every day in knowing the riches of your grace more deeply. You are a good, good God. Lord, I thank you for Broadmead's two-year Bible reading plan. We praise you for the step of faith our leaders have taken in committing this time to reading your word in full and for the success of the plan. I pray for our congregation as we undertake our daily readings. Let us all be inspired by the Spirit and granted divine revelation of your word. I pray for the start of home groups. Thank you that we have the opportunity to meet every Tuesday and walk alongside each other in reading the Bible. Let this be an opportunity to share questions and knowledge about your word and also what you have revealed to us individually and as a group. I pray that we'll, we will all enjoy fellowship with one another and share each other's burdens. For in this way we will fulfill the law of Christ. May new connections be established for those who have moved to a new home group or are going to home group for the first time. Let your grace be multiplied on the home group leaders. Please bless them in their ministry so that they might bless others. I pray for our student community that returning students will be refreshed and new students will settle down and quickly and find community and fellowship at Broadmead. Please be with them as they enter their new student life and meet the challenges of being a young Christian. Help them to stand firm in the truth of the gospel and be loving witnesses to those around them. Let the student Bible studies be an encouragement and reminder to rely on you for everything. I pray that peace may return to the Middle East, that you may intervene in that situation and end the conflict. I pray that everyone suffering and involved in that conflict may come to know you and that you are the answer and hope. Let all who follow you be comforted by the promise that one day you will wipe away every tear from our eyes, that there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. I pray for our international workers, Peter and Louise, that they will be used by you to minister hope to the people of Bangladesh as the country settles from the recent crisis. Please provide for their needs, and I pray that their visa renewal situation will be sorted and that they will get a quick reply. Lord, we pray for Mark and his surgical procedure next Friday. We pray that the procedure will go smoothly and be successful and that Mark might have a speedy recovery. Please bless the doctors and healthcare workers who are looking after him. And please be with Kathy and the rest of Mark's family during this time. I pray for the preaching of the word today, that our hearts will be open to receive what you want us to hear and that we may each come away knowing more of you and your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father.
if you have a Bible, we're going to now um, turn to today's reading. And we're going to read the whole of Revelation chapter 1. If you're in the blue or red church Bibles, that's on page 1,233. And that's the whole of Revelation chapter 1 that we'll be reading together. So page 1,233, if you're in the Church Bible, Revelation chapter 1. The revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw. That is, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it because the time is near. John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits before his throne and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father, To him be glory and power for ever and ever. Amen. Look, he's coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all peoples on earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day I was in the spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, Write on a scroll what you see, and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I turned round to see the voice that was speaking to me, and when I turned I saw seven golden lampstands, and among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe reaching down to his feet and with a golden sash round his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun, shining in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and now look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Write therefore what you have seen, what is now, and what will take place later. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. It always feels like, oh, it always feels like the uh, churches follow more of an academic year than a, than a calendar year. Um, the, Christmas is such a big event, and then we're right back into life right after Christmas, so that, that doesn't feel like a break. Whereas kind of August feels like a time when people can <gasps> catch their breath for a minute, and then we come back refreshed in the autumn. So it feels like we're at the beginning of the year for me in many ways, and hope um, maybe even for you. Um, so if... Here's your confessional moment. If, if you have fallen behind on the Bible in two years, do not be ashamed, but lift it up again. Uh, so I would encourage you to start again on the Bible in two years if, if that's something you maybe have uh, not been able to do over the summer. But I would encourage you to kind of get back on that. Um, in our preaching, John and I have been kind of trying to think, learn the lessons of the first year in the Bible in two years, and we're now trying to focus our preaching uh, less on something new every single week, but we're going to try to follow a mini-series, uh, three to four weeks, 
where we are hopefully in the same book or the same theme, and just trying to um, have just a little bit more kind of continuity, if I can put it that way, between from Sunday to Sunday. And so, um, as has already been said, for the next four weeks, we're going to be looking at the book of Revelation. And for a, for a book whose name means unveiling, clarifying, revealing, I find, and I'm sure you do, Revelation very difficult to understand. And if you do find it difficult to understand, then you're certainly not alone. Uh, but as we read through the month, the book this month, what our prayer is, is that, that we would all just be, have our hearts warmed by the future vision that is in Revelation, by the future plan that we see laid out in Revelation. And on Sundays, we're going to be trying to pick up the pieces a little bit. And uh, so this week, I, I think we're going to be looking at Revelation 1, well, I think, I know. <laughs> we're looking at Revelation 1. I suspect John ne next week is going to be looking at the letters to the churches. And then uh, we've got Steve Wilmshurst, who's like an, like an expert on it, who's written a book and everything, coming to do the difficult part. <laughs> so we, we kind of br we're bringing him into the difficult parts. Uh, I loved what Jay did here. We didn't plan this together, but I loved what he was doing there because it really does fit in with what we want to say here this morning. The light that we are seeing each other by uh, left the sun eight minutes ago. It journeyed from the sun to us in eight minutes, and now it is here. Um, and that means that we live in a solar system. And the solar system has got, it's got nine planets uh, this week. I don't know. They keep changing it, don't they? And they say it is three light years across. And by light years, I guess what they mean is the time it takes for a light to travel. And so the distance is um, how far light would go if it was traveling for a year, I guess. I'm not a scientist. And apparently, three light years is the same as 8.6 trillion miles. So our solar system alone is 8.6 trillion miles along across. And our solar system, of course, is an insignificant part of uh, a galaxy called the Milky Way. And the galaxy, the Milky Way, is 100,000 light years in diameter. And it contains roughly between 100 and 400 billion stars. Between 100 and 400 billion stars just in the Milky Way. And the Milky Way is a, a kind of insignificant galaxy as part of the whole universe. And the, it is estimated that in the, the universe that we can see, uh, there are between 200 billion and 2 trillion galaxies. I mean, it's mind-boggling, isn't it? Each with billions of stars, uncountable numbers of planets. And if the light were to travel from one end of the observable universe to the other end of the observable universe, it would take 92 billion years for light to travel. Here's the thing. Over the last 45 minutes, we as a body of people have been in the presence of the one who formed all of that by the power of his word. We have been in the presence of the one who spoke and created all of that. He is the one who formed it. He is the one who holds it together. It is all in the palm of his hand. And this morning, we want to the eye, we're looking at the eyewitness account of someone who met this person face to face. The Lord of the universe, casually holding seven stars in his hand with a voice like rushing waters, comes to meet the Apostle John. Who is this apostle? Well, over the summer, we've been looking at Peter. We looked at uh, James. John is unique in some ways. because he, he was one of the followers of Jesus. He was a disciple. Um, but he's the only one of the 12 who had a natural death, who kind of died not from being killed in some way, even though, and I don't know how this worked out, but they, they threw him in boiling oil at, um, at one point, and he still managed to survive that. He must have been a crusty old type. Um, so he'd been tortured, 
but he survived. And 60 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus and his return to heaven, John features in, his, in the story of the Bible. He writes his gospel, and he writes the book of Revelation. He's now a very old man, and his initial, initial target is a group of churches in this part of uh, Turkey. Um, but he's on the prison island of Patmos. So he's, on an, a labor, he's in a labor camp, con like a concentration camp, on this little island of Patmos. And he writes, I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering in the kingdom, and patient endurers that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day, I was in the spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, Write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. So Paul, uh, so John had been living in Ephesus. Timothy, who's also mentioned in the Bible, is the bishop of Ephesus. And he has either just died or he's about to be, to be put to death there in the city of Ephesus. And he, he acts like an overseer. And so if he wants to visit these churches, what he will do is he will do like a, a, day's, it's a day's horse ride between all of these places. So he will get on his horse one day and he'll go to the first church, be there a little while, then go on and go on and on. And that's basically what he was doing. He'd be going around. So these seven churches would be people he knew he knows really, really well. But now we find that he's in prison because he's a Christian. And for many people here in the UK, uh, the idea of suffering for being a Christian is a funny thought. Why would you suffer for being a Christian? And that's because we have a form of Christianity that we're following, which is, if I dare, dare say, homogenized, defanged domesticated, uh, focused on personal fulfillment more than anything else. If you ask 100, th if you ask 100 people in our society, what is Christianity? Uh, the, the vast majority will say Christianity is a generic set of moral rules, guidelines that ha it has in common pretty much with all the major religions. Uh, Steve Wilmsworth in his book set, makes an interesting point. He says, when the soldiers came to arrest John, they didn't say, John, we understand that you're a man of faith uh, and that you are propagate values which are shared by all major religions and but just about pretty much by everybody, and so we're consigning you to hard labor in Patmos. It doesn't make sense. There's something about what he's doing that makes him crazy mad that they would take a 95-year-old man and stick him in a labor camp. What is he doing? Well, he himself tells us he's in prison but because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. He's in prison because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. This gentleman is being thrown into a labor camp in his 90s. He's already been in boiling oil because he's willing to suffer. And he's willing to be part of a kingdom which is at odds with society at whole. Because the word of God gets under people's skin. And because the person of Jesus is breathtakingly challenging. The person of Jesus is breathtakingly challenging. John, you see, had spent three years with the man Jesus Christ. He, he'd lived with him. He'd seen him eating, washing. He'd heard him talk. He'd seen Jesus happy. He'd seen him angry. He'd seen him energetic. He'd seen him exhausted. And he had called, been called into Jesus' service as a disciple on the basis of a personal encounter. And only once did he catch a glimpse of the glorified Christ, and that was for a few minutes on the top of a mountain. Most of the time, Jesus was pretty much just like any other person, except he was doing amazing things. And yet his experience of Jesus as, as the incarnate Son of God was so powerful, and God's Spirit working in his life was so transformational that he happily spent 60 years putting up with a lot of suffering for the sake of Jesus. Actually, in his epistle, he writes this in 1 John 1, 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at, our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. 
He says, I saw Jesus with my eyes, he says. I saw him heal the sick. I saw him raise the dead. I saw him cast out demons. I stood at the cross as Jesus died and as he entrusted his mother to my care. I touched his resurrected body. He is the word of life. But what we're seeing now is completely different. What we're seeing now is totally different. Because Jesus, the man, even when he spoke about himself, spoke about himself not as Jesus of Nazareth. The way Jesus spoke about himself frequently was with a code word, code words, the Son of Man, the Son of Man. And in John's Gospel, if you go to that, I think that slide, there we go. In John's Gospel, we see again and again and again and again and again, Jesus is talking and he's referring to himself, often in the third person, as the Son of Man. Now, you have to forgive me if we just get a little bit technical here, but it's super important. Who is the Son of Man? Well, 2,700 years ago, 700 years before Jesus, in Babylon, there's a man called Daniel. And Daniel is a guy who has a lot of visions. And on a certain point, he goes into a trance and he sees a vision. He sees the throne of God. He sees God himself, who he calls the Ancient of Days. And he, the throne room of God is full of light with tens of thousands of people in attendance on the one on the throne. His eyes are, his clothing is white like snow. He has white hair. He has a throne, and out of the throne is coming a river of fire. This is the one who, 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 who uh, Daniel sees in his vision. And then he says, in my vision, this is Daniel 7, I looked, and there before me was the one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worship him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. The Ancient of Days, God himself, is on the throne. The Son of Man approaches. He is given authority, glory, and sovereign power over every living being in the universe. He is, uh, he is the, over all the nations, all the peoples, all language groups. His dominion will never pass away, and his reign and rule will never be destroyed. This is Jesus saying, this is who I am. If you were to get on the Star Trek, I, 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 as a child I used to love Star Trek, not the, not the new ones where they were talking about their feelings all the time, but the, the old ones where it was like science-y. But uh, uh, so I love Star Trek. And um, if you were to get in a, a ship like the Star Trek spaceship and you were to travel across the universe and you were to come to a world where there were sentient beings, if you were to stop and talk to them, you know what they would say? We worship Jesus, our Lord and Master. We worship Jesus, our Lord and Master. We worship the King of Kings. So John in Revelation 1, and this is what Revelation 1 is really focusing on, has an, a vision like Daniel had a vision. He himself is on the island of Patmos. He's, it's our Sunday. He's having a quiet time. He's praying. Maybe there are other people praying with him. And suddenly he is transported to another dimension. And he sees what somebody like the Son of Man. Verse 12 and 13. Let's read it from that. I turned around and saw the voice was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, and with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow. His eyes were blazing fire. His feet were like bronze, glowing in a furnace. And his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand, he held the seven stars. And coming out of his mouth was a sharp, double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. You see the connection between what John sees and what Daniel saw 700 years before. They both have the same vision of Jesus, the Son of, the man, son of man, the great ruler over all of the universe. He has golden clothing. His hair is white, his wool, white as snow. His eyes are like blazing fire. His voice is like the sound of rushing water. But none of this is weird compared to what's coming. Out of his mouth 
is a double-edged sword. So, projecting out of his mouth is a double-edged sword. Now, if you are a friend of Broadmead and you hear it quite frequently, you will know that we talk about this quite often. Uh, in his right hand, he says, he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun, sun shining in all its brilliance. The seven stars are these seven churches that he's communing with, communicating with. We're like a star. But we, we don't have time to go there, but he's these are the seven churches. And this double-edged sword is coming out of his mouth. Now, just one more external link. Uh, in Hebrews 4, we read that the word of God is living and active, sharper than a double-edged sword. The same thing, the word of God. That's why it's coming out of Jesus' mouth. It's the word of God. And the word of God, this double-edged sword, penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. Nothing in incall creation is, is, is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom he is to give account. He says, the word of God cuts like a scalpel. The word of God reveals who we are, our, our situations, our motivations. It tells us who we truly are. The Son of Man reigns in glory, but any contact with him results in a illumination, a revelation, not only of him, but of us. When you experience the Son of Man, you are revealed for who you are. You are revealed for what you are. Any contact with him cuts the very deepest part of who we are. And his glory reveals what we're like. He's too much. You see, while the world is more than happy to talk about Christianity as a religion, the world is more than happy to talk about moral values that Christianity shares with other religions, you will find that when you mention the name of Jesus, everyone gets extremely embarrassed. Everybody just kind of goes, shuts up. In other parts of the world, they may thump you. In the UK, they just go quiet. I've, done it, I've seen it a million times. You mention the name of Jesus, and nobody actually wants to say anything. They're happy to talk about Christianity as a world religion. They're happy to talk about the moral values and the moral, the, the moral principles. But when you mention the name of Jesus, things get extremely awkward extremely quick because the Son of Man unveils who we are and nobody wants to be unveiled. Nobody wants to be revealed. No one wants to be exposed. And so there's embarrassment at the name of Jesus. The world goes strangely mute when the name of Jesus is mentioned. Because even the most cursory engagement with him is deeply uncomfortable. It is an unveiling, it is a revelation of the deepest motivations of our heart. When Jesus it takes center stage, who I am and who you are at the core of your being becomes exposed. And there's not a person in this room who would welcome that. None of us would welcome that. Our thoughts, our habits, our speech patterns, our attitudes. We're ashamed to think that these might be brought out into the open. That the unbearable power of truth and light might illuminate who we are at the core of our being. And yet, please listen very carefully to this point. Jesus is not in the business of humiliating. He's not in the business of putting people down. He's not in the business of unpacking them and leaving them out to hang. He is in the business of healing people. Like a surgeon wielding the scalpel, the word of God goes into the deepest core of who we are for the purpose of healing us, for the purpose of establishing us, for the purpose of blessing us. His mighty power and immeasurable glory is directed towards our redemption and our restoration. 
and he is establishing a kingdom which will never fail, which will never be destroyed, which is growing day by day, moment by moment. Here in this room, we have people from maybe 20, 25 nations. We are an example of this kingdom. If you'd done, if we sat here 200 years ago when this church was still already here, everybody would have been white. Europeans, Northern Europeans. Now we are drawn from every tribe and nation because his, God's kingdom is present in every tribe and nation. And it is growing in leaps and bounds across the world. And it is doing so to bless people. And you're part of that kingdom if you've received Jesus. You're part of that kingdom right now. You have a king. You have a ruler. You have somebody in charge of your life. But he is transforming you. Verse 5 says, To him who loved us and freed us from our sins by his blood, and has, and has made us to be a kingdom of priests to serve his God and Father, to him be glory and power forever. What is God's kingdom? God's kingdom is everybody in the world who comes to the Son of Man, who sees who he is, who allows their hearts to be opened, who receives in their heart that light and says, yes, this is who I am, but I want to be clean. Every person who does that enters into this kingdom. They become citizens of a kingdom. When they say to Jesus, please be my king, then he becomes their king and they get a passport into the kingdom of heaven. And those people who are part of the kingdom of heaven are loved by Jesus. He loves them. He cares for them. Regardless of their performance, he, his love fills your heart, and it, it just makes you, fills you with joy. He frees you from your sin. He forgives you, but he also breaks the power of addiction. He cleanses you. He helps you to feel no longer contaminated, but feel clean like a little child. You become a citizen of his kingdom. You, you, you come into his throne room. He answers your prayers. He guides you, leads you, and he can do more than you can ask or imagine, even today. You become a priest, tasked with interceding for a dying world. Everything you do becomes a sacred offering to him, no matter how mundane. His power strengthens you and energizes you all of your life. His glory and the brilliance of that glory becomes more evident in the darkness. His, his affirmation comes through light and love. Luminosity and applause is ours because we are children of the King. And the glory becomes more evident as the world becomes darker and darker. And it's all pointing to one moment in time. A moment that I believe many people in this room will witness. Maybe not me but I believe many of you will witness that moment when Jesus is coming back. He's coming with the clouds, verse 7. Every eye will see him, even those who pierce him. All peoples on earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. He's coming back. And if the world has anything to go by, he's coming back soon. And every eye will see him. And those who rejected him will mourn, and those who love him will be taken. He says, I'm the Alpha and Omega, who was and is and is to come. The one who walked the garden with Adam and Eve, the one who spoke to Moses in the burning bush, the one who called David, the one who was born in a stable, the one who walked through Galilee with John, the one who suffered outside the, of the walls of Jer Jerusalem, the one who was raised on the third day, the one who ushered John into his presence, is the one who's returning to this world very soon. He holds the universe in the palm of his hand. And he's speaking to you right now. In this moment, he's speaking to you. He's revealing his glory, his light, his love. And the Bible says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Will anybody let me in? How are you responding to Jesus? How are you responding to Jesus? You know, there are many Christians, and for them, Jesus is a fire insurance policy. I'll believe in Jesus, and then I won't go to hell. 
I'll put my trust in Jesus, and I'll say, yep, I believe he died for me, rose for me. Yep, good. I'm not going to hell now. I can carry with my life. Fire insurance policy. Others have a transactional relationship with Jesus. Okay, Jesus, I'll come to church on Sunday. I'll go to home group. I'll go to prayer meeting. And then you've got to give me this, this, and this. If I'm a good boy, you've got to reward me. A transactional relationship with Jesus. For others, there's an antagonistic relationship with Jesus. Jesus, you didn't do what I wanted, and now I'm really angry at you. You can't be good because you didn't give me what I wanted. You didn't fix things the way I wanted them fixed. Others project on Jesus their own ideas. They project onto Jesus whatever's, whatever Twitter's saying this week. And they, they kind of want Jesus to somehow embody that. And we make these mistakes because we don't see Jesus as he is. We don't see him in his glory. All we see is the preacher of morality on by the Sea of Galilee. We don't see the Son of Man coming in glory. But people are blessed and their lives are completed and they know joy, power, and fullness when they read aloud these words and they make them their own. Blessed is the one, verse 3, who reads aloud the words of this prophecy and blessed are those who hear it and take it to heart what is written in it because the time is near. Are you ready to be blessed this morning? Are you? Are you ready to receive the blessing that God has for you this morning? Receive his word, hear it, and act on it. Can you see him extending his hand and saying, trust me. Trust me for more than just a fire insurance policy. Trust me to know what I'm doing. Trust me to be me and not be what you think I ought to be. Will you put your trust in me? Will you receive me? Now, I know myself, I know people. And it's very easy for people to have a faith which is never ever um, enunciated, which is never spoken out. Very easy for us to have a whole set of theological ideas that we kind of keep in our heart and mind. And yeah, we hold on to them, but we never actually express them. We never actually act on them. This is a passive kind of faith. You don't know what kind of faith you have if it only remains passive. Faith has to be active. Here he says, those who hear the words and act on them. Those who hear the words and receive them. Romans 10 says, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. If you declare with your mouth, the Bible doesn't see a place for this kind of internal religious set of ideas. It only sees people who declare what they know to be true. And that's why we want to encourage you. We, we try to encourage each other to declare with our mouths the truths of God's word. And that's why we, I encourage, you know, we encourage each other to pray out loud. I'm sorry, I don't want to embarrass anybody, but it really is important to speak out these truths. And so um, we've got a prayer coming up here. And should we just say that prayer together? And so if I, if I, I'll begin and then please join in with me and just say the, let's, let's say the prayer together and let's speak out what we believe to be true. Lord Jesus, thank you for, that you love us. You have freed us from our sins by your blood. Yes. You have made us a kingdom of priests. Yes. We choose to serve and, our God and Father. We embrace your will and your glory. Fill us with your power. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, you may never have reached out to Jesus that way before. You may never have put your trust in him before. And if that's the case, if you're new to all of this and you've never done this, we'd like to give you a copy of the gospel. It's the gospel of Mark. It's, in, it's, it's love, laid out beautifully. And we just have to encourage you to take this and, and just read it. So if you've never made this step before, please put your hand up. And we'll just let like this uh, come out on now to bring your gospel around to you. God bless you. Thanks, Mark. I wonder how you see the, the Son of Man as we've been reading about. 
Let's just take a moment of quiet, and then um, we're going to sing the lion and the lamb that really picks up on some of this language of Jesus returning, coming on the clouds in power and in might and strength. Let's just have a moment of quiet and then we'll sing together. Why don't we stand together and let's sing the lion and the lamb. Let's sing, it's coming on the clouds. He's coming on the clouds, King the kings will bow down. And every chain will break, as broken hearts declare his praise. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain by the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains. And every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. And every knee. So open up the gates, make way before the King of Kings. The God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles, and every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. And every knee will bow. Stop the Lord Almighty. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? 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 Who can stop the Lord? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb. Slain for the sins of the world, his blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb, and every knee will bow before him. 
just going to read uh, another couple of um, verses that we read earlier. Um, it says, Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father, to him be glory and power for ever and ever. Amen. Um, we are going to sing one more song. Um, just, I feel like this is a, a song that is a, a, an appropriate one. It's called, And Can It Be? And it's what we have seen this morning of the Son of Man. How, how can it be the God that holds stars in his hand has died for us and has made a way for us to know him? And this song just plays on that. And, it's, and it just praises God for that. And it questions it and it, and it marvels at it. Um, so I do appreciate if you, if you do need to go or, or whatever, then please, uh, you, you can do that. But we're going to just continue. We're going to sing this song together. Um, if you'd like to pray with someone, please do uh, go to the prayer team at the back. They're waiting. I uh, would happily pray with you. But we're going to continue uh, a time of praise by singing And Can It Be. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? Died he for me who caused his pain, for me who him to death pursued? And amazing love, how can it Thou, my God, should die for me. Amazing, Amazing love, love, how can, how it, can be it be that Thou, my God, should die for me? Tis mystery. Tis mystery all the immortal dies.
let's just pray one more time as we stand. Father, we praise you for the Son of Man in all his splendor and majesty. And that picture language, Lord, is just incredible. And Father, thank you that through Jesus we can boldly approach the eternal throne and claim the crown through Christ my own. Let me just read from Hebrews 4 to close. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to feel sympathy for our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Amen. Amen. Well, please do have a seat. That is the end of our, our formal time together. Please do go and pick up your children, continue those conversations, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Goodbye.